Hello and welcome to lesson 10-2. That rhyme, I didn't even try to make it rhyme. Anyway, we are looking at our last lesson of activity 10 and uh, subsequently our last lesson before our next test on activities 9 and 10. And this lesson is muy importante, uh, very important. As we transition into activity 11, we're seeing this concept here of congruence. We've learned a previous definition of congruence. Um, two figures are congruent if they have the same measure. And we're going to see how transformations that we learned in activity 9, how transformations really unfold another way to look at this idea of congruence. So as always, as always, let's look at our learning targets. We will determine whether given figures are congruent. We're going to determine whether given figures are congruent. And then going back to our previous activities, we will specify a sequence or composition of rigid motions that will carry a given figure to a congruent figure. So we know that congruent means, let's put that definition, figures that have the same measure. We're going to see how that really ties in to transformations. So as always, be sure to rate your understanding of these two learning targets just based on your previous knowledge. Remember one, we don't, we're not really confident at all of what these learning targets are saying. And five, we are super confident. We completely understand what these learning targets are asking us. So without further ado, let's look at lesson 10-2. If you would, go and draw a line all the way at the bottom of the page. And just to recall, when you see that line at the bottom of the page, that means you're going to work through all that text before playing through the video. So go back, highlight things, take a look, read carefully as we start our new lesson. So hopefully you've taken a second to read through the text. Right here at the beginning, we are seeing a new definition of congruency. And we can look over here in our math terms. Two figures are congruent if and only if. That's a biconditional statement. So a composition of rigid motion maps one to the other. So we can actually prove two figures are congruent if we can find a series or a composition of rigid motions that maps one figure to the other. And notice they tell us right here, we could probably guess just by looking at these things, but remember mathematics is not about a guessing game. And so we're gonna prove those things by suggesting a series of rigid motions. You could probably guess that triangle E is not congruent to these other triangles, not just because it looks that way, but of what was highlighted here in green, isosceles triangle A, B, C, and D are congruent because a series of rigid motions, translations, rotations, or reflections can map any of the triangles onto another. So we're not just saying that uh, figures that are congruent have the same measure. We're saying that a series of rigid motions can map one onto the other. I highlighted this portion here, very important. The definition of congruent figures applies both on and off the coordinate plane. And Here's another way to contextualize this idea. And I encourage some of you to practice this. If you trace a figure, then rotate, reflect the tracing. The tracing will fit exactly over any congruent figures. That's really what mapping means. And that's why I highlighted that text. It's really what mapping means. So one, they ask you to shade all the figures that appear to be congruent to figure A. And this was hopefully a pretty easy exercise. But notice what I wrote out here next to uh, number one, consider what rigid motions would map figure A onto the other figures you believe, believe figure A is congruent to. So start to consider what, what rigid motions, what series of rigid motions would map this figure A onto this figure. Um, think about how rotations work, how reflections work, how translations. So consider those things as we press on.
To prove that two figures are congruent, a specific combination of rigid motions must be found that maps each point of one figure to a corresponding, let's highlight that real quick, corresponding point of the other figure. So if you would, go ahead and draw a line under number five. So again, work through items two through five on your own before playing through the video, and then we'll look at six together. Okay, so hopefully you took a second uh, to complete items two through five. So two said, predict whether the two triangles shown in the figure are congruent. So this is a prediction. We will prove it and explain your prediction. I said, yes, they appear to be congruent as corresponding sides and angles have the same measure. It's easy here for us to tell or to look at. We see that this side is three units long, and then we see that this side is three units long. And then we could do something very similar to another side. We could say this side of the triangle is four units long, and this side is four units long. And that last side, if you actually use Pythagorean theorem, that's actually five units long as well. So we could actually see that these corresponding sides are the same length. So these two triangles definitely appear to be congruent. And so three says, how can your prediction be confirmed? Well, the whole idea of lesson 10-2 is not measuring these things. And that's what some of you probably wrote down. But the way we can confirm our prediction is by identifying a composition of rigid motions that map one figure onto the other. If the definition of congruency can be based on a composition of rigid motions, that's what we're trying to use here. So I know, again, a lot of you probably on your own put that they could have the same measure or show that they have the same measure. The idea here is to understand how this composition or series of rigid motions can actually prove two figures congruent. Item four then takes a little bit deeper understanding, conceptual understanding. Could a single translation, reflection, or rotation map one of the triangles onto the other? Explain. I said a big no. I've had students in the past that would argue that there's probably a center of rotation somewhere in this region. Um, it's very difficult to find. And in fact, it's probably so uh, fractional or decimal that we can't find an exact center of rotation here. Um, so I said no, corresponding sides are not parallel. If you recall from our translation exercises, um, a translation does not turn or rotate or change the orientation of a figure. So if you notice these two yellow sides now, they're not parallel to each other. So there's no way that a single translation could do this. Um, and then I also said no one line of reflection. Um, if we were to draw any kind of line of reflection, uh, remember however far a point is from the line of reflection, that's how far it is on the other side of the line of reflection, or the corresponding point is. And so we can't actually draw any kind of line of reflection. Uh, just look at the distances between corresponding points. There's no obvious line that we could draw. And then I also said no center of rotation as well. But, and that's a very important but, Look at item five. How could a rotation followed by a translation map one triangle onto the other? So I said, and hopefully you can see it here, that if we were to rotate either of these triangles 90 degrees by some center of rotation, and again, we're, if we were starting with this triangle, we rotated 90 degrees clockwise, or if we started with this triangle, we could rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, just depending on which triangle we started with. But again, that's not really the purpose. We're just trying to show that the two figures are congruent. But after a rotation of 90 degrees, so that corresponding sides are parallel, then we could translate so those corresponding points are mapped onto one another. So I believe, and I think the book agrees, that a rotation and a translation can actually help us show that these two triangles are congruent. Now, does it really matter which one we do first? No, but will the specific um, details of our rigid motions change depending on if we do rotation then translation? Absolutely. That's what we learned in lesson 10-1. The order of rigid motions does actually affect.
Sorry about that. But again, what we're seeing here is how these rigid motions can map one triangle onto another. So let's look at six together. It says propose, propose excuse me, a composition of rotation and translation to map the triangle in the first quadrant onto the triangle in the third quadrant, then complete the table to test your proposal. So before we go any further, I want to make sure we know what the first and third quadrant are. So uh, this top right quadrant where everything, all X's and all Y's are positive is the first quadrant. This quadrant, which is actually counterclockwise, is quadrant two. And this bottom left quadrant where everything is negative is quadrant three. And this last one is quadrant four. Now, again, we have to specify which one we're starting with because that will change the direction of the rotation. That will change the translation. So we're starting with this triangle here. I'll actually call it triangle A. And we're trying to show that it maps onto figure B. So keep that in mind. So I do want to suggest before we complete this table or before we even propose a composition of rotation and translation, there's multiple ways we can perform this. The book will say one thing, other resources will say another. So do not get bogged down with one method to show that these two triangles are actually congruent using a composition of a rotation and translation. So they are suggesting here that we perform a rotation first, then a translation. So I'm going to follow that idea. So let's go up to our diagram and see how we could rotate so that figure A maps onto figure B. So I believe the easiest thing that we could do is to rotate around this point, this bottom left vertice of triangle A, rotate around that point so that, and I'll draw it kind of loosely or kind of light, so that my triangle will actually do something one two, three, four, and then it'll be three here. So it's going to look something like this after I rotate around this point zero two. And then I can translate so that this vertice ends up here. Again, it, uh, this vertice won't move in the rotation because I'm actually using it as the center of rotation. So it will rotate around this point and then I'll translate it appears to be down two and left three so that those corresponding points align. So that's the rotation I'm going to perform and the translation that I'm going to perform. So we are going to rotate. Let's go back up here. We're going to rotate 90 degrees clockwise, which is actually a negative degree rotation. Remember, it's like opening down. So we're going to rotate. Let me change that. So it's full opacity. We're going to rotate. 90 degrees clockwise around point zero 0.02. So a rotation around the point zero 0.02, and again, a 90 degrees clockwise rotation is a negative 90 rotation. So let's figure out where those points will go, and then we'll suggest what translation we'll see here. So the point zero 0.02, since that is the center of our rotation, 0, 2 will actually map to 0, 2. Then let's look at where 0, 5 is. 0, 5 is this red point here. So after the rotation 90 degrees clockwise, uh, 0, 5 will actually end up at 3, 2. And then our last point, 4, 2, which is this pink point way out here, this point will end up actually at 0, negative 2. So I want to take a quick second and show that work we saw back in Activity 9, performing rotations when the center of rotation is not the origin. So the center of rotation is 0, 2. So I wanted to show, maybe you can't see it in the diagram or the chart above, um, show how 0, 5 can map to 3, 2. So recall we take the pre-image point, we subtract the center of rotation that kind of translates it to the origin. So 0, 5 take away 0, 2 is 0, 3. 
And then we perform the 90 degrees clockwise rotation, which tells us to swap the two numbers and change the second sign. Uh, but changing the sign of zero is not a thing because it's neither positive nor negative. And so we have the point three zero, and then we add the center of rotation back, zero two added to three zero, and we get the point three two as we predicted. So if you like the mathematical steps to uh, find the image point when the center of rotation is not the origin, this is how you do it. You can go back to, I believe it's lesson nine dash four rotations uh, to see that in more detail. So this is where we're ending up after the rotation. Now let's look at translating so that this point, let me just change the opacity, that this point here now translates to that one. And so in order to do that, again, we translate down to and left three. Uh, but remember the order, we actually move left three first and then down two. That's the way we're gonna write the translation notation. So let's go back. Let me change the opacity. So we are translating left three and down two. So the way we're gonna represent that is left three and down two. Remember if we um, are negative on the X axis, that's to the left. If we are negative on the Y axis, that's down. And so a translation of negative three, negative two means left three and down two. And we see here that if we took zero, took away three, we would get negative three. And we took two, take away two, we do get zero. If we take three, take away three, we get zero. And two, take away two, we get zero. And last, zero, take away three, we get negative three. And negative two, take away two, we get negative four. So number seven, was your prediction correct? Yes, indeed. And I really wanna stress this here corresponding points were mapped from one figure to another. It's very important here because it's easy to get lost in these rigid motions, how to map specific points, um, especially if our understanding of rigid motions is still pretty weak, but it's very important that this point here, this what I highlighted in green, actually maps to its corresponding point on figure B. So keep that in mind as we move on. So if you would, draw a line under number 10 again. Uh, pause the video now, complete eight through 10 on your own before playing through the video to see what I came up with. And I do wanna stress here on eight through 10, my answers, the book answers are not the only answers. So if you feel like you need to um, see if what you came up with it is correct, so you're on the right track, please do not hesitate to ask me. So hopefully you had a second to complete these on your own. I really do want to stress here that they are not necessarily telling us which, um, which of these quadrilaterals will map onto the other. It's really just giving a broader understanding of how these rigid motions work. So again, whatever answer I came up with with 10 or what the book came up with is not the only answer, but I'm just gonna use this one to explain it. So A says predict whether the quadrilaterals are congruent. And so they do appear to be congruent. I believe corresponding size of the figures are the same size or measure. Uh, nine, how could you test your prediction? That's really what we're all getting to in activity or lesson 10-2, identify a series of rigid motions. And so 10, follow your plan to test your prediction. I went ahead and wrote it as a composition of rigid motions to help um, you remember from 10-1 how to write it. So I am suggesting that we rotate it 90 degrees clockwise around point B. I'm talking about this quadrilateral A, B, C, D. That's the one I'm gonna rotate 90 degrees clockwise around point B. Then I'm gonna translate using directed line segment B, G. So I'm gonna see if I can show that a little bit here. So if we rotate quadrilateral A, B, C, D around point B, um, point B on this quadrilateral is not gonna move. A will end up here, so A prime. B will remain in the same point. C will end up, or C prime will end up somewhere out here, and D will end up 
here. So this is roughly what it's going to look like after the rotation around that point. And then I wanted B to map to point G, and I wanted where A is now at E, I wanted E to map to F, so I said use a directed line segment BG so that all of these points now on my new quadrilateral, or the rotated quadrilateral, all of those points map onto uh, quadrilateral BEFG. So this is not the only way. And in fact, if you used quadrilateral BEFG for the beginning of your rigid motion, obviously it's going to change um, what I came up with. Before we go any further, I do want to go back to this page, and I think it'd be very important or very good for us, good practice, to rewrite this uh, series of rigid motions as an actual composition. So if we rotated first, see where I'm going to write this, if we rotated first, that's going to be on the inside of our parentheses. So rotated around the center 0 to 90 degrees clockwise. That's on the inside of our parentheses when it's the first rigid motion we perform. And then our second rigid motion we perform, we put to the left of uh, the initial one. So we're going to write translate negative three, negative two. And that actually looks like negative three, positive two. So let me give it a little more space. Negative three, negative two. I think that's just great practice on activity or lesson 10-1. So we're actually going to bypass through the check your understanding. You can work on it. Obviously, it's a great exercise. And we're going to go and move on to page 137. If you would, go ahead and draw a line all the way at the bottom of our page. So through 16, I'm going to ask that you complete this on your own and then play the video forward if you are unsure or want to check your work. Or maybe see how I explain to you through a couple things on page 137. So pause the video, try it on your own before playing through. So hopefully you took a second to read through it. This text really right here, I often bypass it, but what it's going to do is when we see this concept later in activity 11 and beyond, hopefully you'll recall these things that I've highlighted. So we learned another definition of congruent figures back in activity 4. Uh, this definition involves the measurements of sides and angles. Again, figures that are congruent have the same measure. Um, and they're really hinting at something we're going to see a little later on, known as side angle side, where we show two triangles are congruent. So um, this first idea, if two triangles each have sides of length A, B, and C, in other words, two triangles have the same side measures, then the triangles are congruent. That's actually called side, side, side. And just, I want to put that bug in your ear as we press on into activity 11. Uh, we can also uh, show congruency that two triangles each have two sides of lengths A and B. And then the angle between those two sides is the same in both triangles. So that's actually called side angle side. So I just want to put that bug in your ear. Since we're talking about congruency, um, before we move into activity 11. If two figures are congruent by one of the two definitions we just uncovered in activity four or activity 10, are they congruent by the other definition as well? Yes. So we can actually use this idea of same measure or rigid motions to prove congruency. I'm actually going to write that. Uh, same measure or uh, rigid motions. equals congruent. Hopefully that kind of sums up that right there. So um, this idea here is just really taking uh, this concept of rigid motions just one step further. So don't get bogged down in this. Obviously, line segment B is not the same length as line segment A. That's not the point here. Um, so line segment A connects points 2, 3. That's 2, 3, 2, 5, 3. And line segment B connects 1, 0 to 1, negative 6. So 13 said, find a composition of two rigid motions that maps line segment B to a line segment B prime that overlaps line segment A. So I said, and I believe the book said something similar, if we rotate uh, 
line segment B around the point one zero, which is here, 90 degrees counterclockwise, it will end up what I call this little green line here, just so you can see it after the rotation. And then we still need to translate to the right one and then up three. That's what this notation means, translate right one and up three to what I've drawn in this light yellow color B prime to map on top of or overlap specifically, overlap figure A. 14 says, what pair of points does line segment B prime connect? Well, we lined up this left point to three so that it would kind of bump up against figure A. And so the end of B prime would be located out here at two eight. So I said two three to two eight. So we can obviously tell that B prime and or figure B prime and figure A are not the same length. 15, can you add a third rigid motion to the composition that maps B prime? Well, rigid motions do not change size or shape. Therefore, no rigid motion could show B prime is congruent to A. So we would actually have to shorten B prime or somehow extend A to show that these two are congruent. And that's not a rigid motion. It's actually called a non-rigid motion. Last and certainly not least, 16, in the composition you identified, what subsection, what, what part of line segment B maps onto line segment A exactly? What is the length of this subsection? So I know that figure A is only three units long. So I'm trying to figure out what of line segment B, what section of line segment B mapped perfectly onto figure A. Well, if figure A is only three units long, I'm looking for three units of figure B. Well, if I rotate it around the point one zero, I'm really taking this section to right here and then taking that section up to figure A. So I said the section one zero, which is located right here, and the section one negative three, which is located here. So it rotates, ends up here, and then it translates to the right one and then up three. And the reason being is this section is three units in length for line segment B and figure A is three units in length. So that is 10-2, uncovering what a composition of rigid motions can prove. It can prove congruency. We don't just have to show that they're the same size and measure. We can actually use a series of rigid motions to show that two figures are congruent. So as always, go back to your learning targets, re-rate those as your understanding, hopefully, of this lesson increase. And don't forget to complete the lesson practice Reach out to me if you still have any questions about 10-2. Thanks for watching.